Good evening. Tonight in True Stories, we visit the industrial town of Port Piri, now fighting to survive the economic and environmental realities of the 90s in modern times. Well, this is new Port Piri railway station here. So if you come to Port Piri by train, this is where you end up here at Coonamaya. There was one bloke I hoped I would see again, but I wasn't too sure he'd remember me. We always had a name for you. Tom had a name for everybody. He always used to be first. I reckon it was Flash. Flash Chase. And he used to, just how he used to dive in, because he used to be running everywhere, didn't he? He used to streak around. It's like a, a clapped out ballet dancer he was. Neil was one of the projectionists at the old picture theater. And he probably started me off in this film business a long time ago. Another brother, another brother, this my mother in law and my mum. Hey. What do you what do you reckon should be in this film? Um, well I think it should be um, I think all the controversy about the um, lead problem um, being put in the papers a few years back wasn't necessary. Um, it's true we have got a lead problem in Port Pirie, but nowhere to the extent that it was um, I think it was blown out of proportion actually. Um, well, who blew it out of proportion? The papers and the reporters. Um, I think they made Piri look like we were just um, a place at the end of the earth. I have two young children and I've lived here all my life and I really, quite honestly, wouldn't want to live anywhere else. You um, think they really, yes, really wouldn't want to live anywhere else? I think you'll find if a lot of children were tested in places in big cities that they'd have a lead problem also in their bodies. Yeah, but you'd rather not have it, would you? <laughs> Oh yes, it was necessary to be done, but um, I think if I was a person looking and I'd never been to the place, I would have never wanted to come here. I would have thought it was a terrible place. And it's just not like that. You won't want to leave by the time it's time for you to leave. Because that's just what people do. Upset as they drive in, thought, oh good heavens, you know, where, where have I come? And they've cried a lot harder when they've left. So, you stop here for a few months and you won't go again. You won't go away. They're worse than taxi drivers. You don't get all the hassles that you get in the big cities. Kids grow up in a much safer environment. For several years now, I'd been reading stories in newspapers about Port Piri and how the town was found to be contaminated by the lead smelters, that children were being made retarded, that there were record numbers of birth defects and miscarriages, and that to clean it up would take many years and cost millions. Port Piri's not the prettiest place in the state. For a hundred years, the town's lead smelters have been churning out pollution. The problem's been there for some time, and after all, the kids are not out there eating handfuls of the soil or the slag. What about the general status of this operation here at Port Piri? Is that really on the line as well? Um, well, I'd have to say uh, the operation at current metal prices would just would not be viable. We have to go out and even now 
to get uh, additional supplies of concentrates from, from overseas. It's going to make the current operation very uneconomic and we would have to assess very carefully whether in fact we could invest in new technology to make this place a long-term success. The only thing we've got here is the smell is. It seems unbelievable to me for anyone to even think that the smelters could ever close down. For me, the smelters had always been there and would always be there, and therefore be the only real reason for the town, the lifeblood of the community and all other business, where it seemed everyone devoted their lives and where even later their headstones on their graves would automatically stand respectfully forever facing their master, the smelters. As a child, I would ride past these graves on my way to school, always seeing my father's grave, and because it was not a subject ever to discuss, always wonder why he died before I could ever remember him. to strange people in this business, I tell you. They come along and they ask you what you're doing. They know what you're doing. One, one day a guy come along to me and he said, what are you doing? I said, putting the plays up. He said, why? No, I, I, I was taking them down, that's right. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking them down. He said, why are you taking them down? I said, because I put them up every morning. And he was sort of three parts into the wind. And he, he looks up the pole and I'm sure he's wondering how I got up that pole to put that flag up the top there. Didn't dawn on him that that's the thing you put it on. Never mind. Well, Nifty now puts up his flags in the main street where once mighty steam trains used to run. Other things have changed a bit. There's even this new bridge across the river. But it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Well, this is our uh, bridge to nowhere. Um, it was built under a, uh, one of the old red schemes. That's Dennis, uh, the mayor. A few he years seemed ago. like a bloke going places. And uh, now correctly, or well, more correctly called by supposedly the, uh, the John Perry Bridge, but all the locals, of course, refer to as the Bridge to Nowhere. Um, I'm not sure how the name uh, got there, but it's like a lot of nicknames. It's very accurate in its description because you can see it's a well-designed bridge, single lane, set of traffic lights, um, only set of traffic lights uh, in Port Perry to absolutely nothing. Presumably, there was going to be some sort of industry over there. Nobody really knows what, uh, but speculation ranges normally around uh, a uranium enrichment plant, something like that. And people talk about that because uh, it's a one-way bridge and that would provide security and so on. That's Frank, and he's my best mate. What are you doing in this part of the world? And we went to school together. Come and give us a hand. Come on, I've got the jammy over here. Unbelievable. He was the mate I always looked up to. Got the old, old girl going. This is my baby. He's three weeks older than me. What brings you to this part of the world? You come to live with the human people now, not the rat race like they do over in Sydney. Best life here, Port Perry, top of the world. Well, I'm about to finish this. You want to come inside and have a coffee? All right. Uh, birthday. Halfway there, 50 years. to Franco, from Nicoletta and Nicola Gaudio. That's very good. Frank married Eileen, and they had twins, Nadine and Angela. Hi, Mari Rang, regarding those... Uh... Oh, it wasn't me, huh? Oh, the, the, you're doing the mince pies for the hospital? The Christmas show? She's going to Adelaide. And she said you have to take it around to her place between 12 and half past. Philip will be home. OK? I'll go there. Nadine is flat out studying for her final exams because she hopes to go on to university. Angela has got up before everyone else and has gone into the local radio station to practice for an opening as an announcer when a vacancy might happen. She's been doing this for almost a year, but the station is small and there's probably a waiting list. 104.5 CS, that was Cold Chisel, Flame 3. 
20 past 8, good morning. Ace Computer taking 3 to 10. Coming up next. Angela, I think I'm going to have to kick you out. Fair enough. You done enough work? Yes. Right. Okay, I've got to set up these tapes. Better clean them first. I've got John Moore's coming down on the second half. I'd like to be a radio announcer or get into the radio industry somehow. And in, say, five, ten years, maybe be an afternoon announcer or so. I wouldn't mind starting off as a, a mid-dawn just to entertain all, all the people that are awake early hours of the morning. Well, I think I see the same as it was 35 years ago. I mean, things take time to change around Perry, but um, things have changed. I mean, you would notice yourself that there's a few differences, but we're, we're pretty much the same as we were 35 years ago, I guess. Well, there's, there's, there's so many on the unemployment list now that um, I don't know the exact figures. This is what's happening. She's a hairdresser. As soon as uh, she was qualified, her hours were locked, nearly did nothing, and so she decided to buy her own business to be fully employed. I've noticed a lot of changes since I've been away for seven years. I spent what, three years in Adelaide and four years up at Roxby Downs, which is you know, out in the middle of the desert, but probably the same sort of environment as what Perry was 35 years ago. Because everything, all the sporting things you, just, you can walk to and all your friends are close. You don't have to get very far to their house and everything. And it's really close and you know a lot of people. But then there's only so much you can do here. And then you think, oh, where do I go now? So, I'd go, if I had a chance, definitely go. Where? I would, it wouldn't bother me, just as long as I had a job that I, I like, then settle down, just try and get to know people and that. We're coming up to what I consider to be one of the really great attractions of Perry, and one that visitors always comment on when they come into the town as well. And that's our main street. It's unique in a couple of ways. First of all, there's this curvilinear uh, part of it. Uh, which was done deliberately by the uh, Surveyor General when it was put down. And uh, not necessarily all the buildings in themselves have got great architectural significance, but the fact they all fit together so neatly uh, is great. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the buildings have gone. Some re remain. The family hotel here, for instance, a really beautiful old building. What I want to do is show you how to do a main. It's just going down the main street, um, past shops, boat ramp, beach, and see the silence, see who's out. Mainly uh, to waste time. The Barriott Hotel was just here, big three-storey building. Unfortunately, that uh, that had to go. The foundations were bad. Next door here was uh, our <laughs> what's currently our council chamber, and what was an ozone theatre, one of only two left in South Australia. So that's what happened to my old cinema. That, I think, was my first. One of my first big fights in the town, I've had a couple of fights in the town, and that was one. I really didn't think that the building should have been torn down. Um, the, the, the previous council at the time, Bill Jones, mayor, the minute's wisdom believed it should have. Down the beach, beachy. The Solomon Town Beach, and it's been here as long as I can remember, 18 and a half years. Minko Metals BHAS, the largest uh, lead smelter and refiner in the world. And the stack you see there uh, is over, well, 200 metres taller than the uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge. And the town would be built as close as possible. The people hugging it, loving it, really. With the size of the town always being determined by the economies of the smelters. And for all of its life, making a fortune for the company's shareholders and therefore being a reliable employer of labour to become a working man's town. A boom town built in a hurry on a muddy mangrove swamp sliced by a small river, which I think was discovered by an English explorer, possibly experiencing navigating difficulties. 
but it was all that was needed for the necessary shipping to the world of an urgent industry. An industry to handle the mineral bonanza 500 miles away in the desert town of Broken Hill, brought to the smelters by steam train in this new age of steel and steam. Trains and rail that would link up with the rest of the nation. A town built for the convenience of the smelters, with the trains running up the main street and into them. The train I left on was probably this one. This port became one of the busiest in the nation, supplying metals to the factories of the industrial world. Metals for industry and war. This world to me seemed far away, and the only idea I had of other worlds came to me from regular supplies of Warner melodrama, Paramount history, RKO crime and Columbia comedy, as well as movie tone news and lots of Technicolor tap dancing. It was a world I loved and I wanted to be in it. Frank was in it with me. He was a tray boy selling chocolates and ice creams, but only really so he could see everything for nothing. Oh, we're gonna get a storm this afternoon. No worries. You're all right. Set with us. You need to get nice and clear with the hills in the background. You can see the cranes working now. See the cranes working now. The big swans. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. How are you? Hey. What have you been up to? Not a great deal. How's the job searching? Slow. <laughs> what ideas have you got to um, try and help battle on? Yes. Um, I was wondering if I a documentary on just the lack of jobs and unemployment in Piri. I could just do that. Use the studio for that. Interview people. Um, let them have their say on, on it. It's not a bad idea because in the results, I think there's about 2,000 young unemployed people in, in the city of Port Perry, so that's something that needs to be uh, addressed. How do you want to handle that? Do you want to go to the um, CES? Um, do you want to talk to people in the street that you see just walking up and down with nothing uh, just, in particular? Yeah, no basically interest? Basically everyone, even people at the smelters, because it, there's jobs that can be lost there. Yeah. Um, railways. Railways, yeah, that's pretty important uh, too, isn't it? Maybe you can put it to air. Yeah, well, if it's good enough, by all means, yeah. Things have changed along the road a bit. People out in the big, big cities probably think we've got dirt roads here in Port Berry. But we've got bitumen, we're civilised. So we're going to catch a train. We've got them, it's only three o'clock. There she goes. Do you know anyone that's out of work or just lost their jobs? No. What do you think of the, the lack of employment in Port Perry? Disgusting. I won't be working here, I'll be going down to Adelaide when I leave school. Do you know anyone that's been out of work or just lost their jobs lately? Yeah, me. Oh, I was just uh, one of those things with Australian National I was employed with. So I decided to take the package. Well, I've been all over the place looking for work, you know, not, not just here. Um, and there's very, uh, because I'm unskilled, there's nothing around, you know, unskilled labourer. So there's nothing around for people that 
that are like me, sort of thing. Well, there's not much to. It's pretty bad actually. Then the smell is starting to put people off. Have you both got jobs yourselves? Yeah. yeah. But we're self-employed. Oh. <laughs> so, only because we had to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, okay then. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Not good. Not one positive comment yet. Now going to see Ron Redford, manager of the Port Perry local newspaper and recorder. Been in the media for many years now, so he should know something about why this happened. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late. That's fine. Now, what are we up to? Um, what are we up to? What are we talking about? Would you fellows like a cup of coffee? No. Would you like a cup of coffee? Oh. Yeah, unemployment in Port Perry is not as bad as perhaps the figures uh, make it look, but it is disappointing that our young people have to go to Adelaide to get jobs but perhaps people don't go after them with the, the sort of fervour that I believe they should go after them with, so. Well, with the smelters making these metals, don't you think there should have been a backup industry to um, make things out of the metals? There's been a lot of publicity about the rare earth plant. From a personal point of view, I would like to see that go ahead. And I know there's been some scaremongering and all, uh, lots of different lines of thought. Now, whilst we've got people that are saying that it shouldn't happen, uh, we're not going to grow. While we've got people saying that it should happen, uh, we will grow. And hopefully out of that will come more jobs for young people and middle-aged people and old people in Port Perry. See, it's not only the young that's affected by it. There's, um, there's a lot of people out of work in Port Perry and in Australia, but they're not all young. is one of the remaining 18 wharfies left. And their jobs are being contested by the national government and big foreign controlled multinational shipping companies who are introducing waterfront reform, rationalisation of its workforce to bring it to the so-called parallel efficiencies of the world waterfronts, particularly of the third world. Another six and a half hours just standing there. First 20 years are the hardest. Not that it gets easy. Who gets to feed the kids anyhow? I've been on the wharf 30 years. I've been 36 years. 36 years. 36 years. Yes. Oh, it's a little bit easier now. Like before, well. We had to shovel this. That's right. We had to shovel this and carry the lead. Carry the lead. Carry wheat. Wheat was about 185 pounds. It was 102 pounds. years between the three of us on the wall. 36, 36 and 30. So we've seen a few ships come in and out. Yeah, I joined the Port Augusta, I did. Port Augusta, I joined. And they closed the port in Port Augusta. So the blokes that are there, some of them went to Adelaide, some come here, and some of them on the Wyala. They live at Port Augusta, they still travel from Port Augusta yeah, to Wyala. Yeah, they work at Wyala. Keep the job. They close the port there, I don't know why. Yeah, my mate. Going fishing. See that boat there? That, that plane's with 2,000 pounds of fish. That boat does? It's yeah. like that boat going out fishing, it's like going to the Commonwealth Bank. When he comes home with his fish, puts them in his fish shop, there's money for jam. All own profit. He's only got one man in the plane that's bloke in the boat with him. He's got his own fish shop. I was going to do that. Makes good money. Chuck the wharf in, go full time fishing. But the family didn't like the idea. Why not? Oh, they, <laughs> they reckon you buddy, you do that and you'll be the black sheep of the family. <laughs> See, all my family, all my wife's family does that. They've got their own fish shop there. But uh, I was going to make the you know, building the owner. But they didn't like the idea. So the wife said, don't worry about it. Stick to the wall, sir. Stick to the wall. Only got a few more years, I'll retire. Five more years I got. The outside. He's outside again. Oh, Jesus, I'm throwing him again. <laughs> 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 
beauty too. Here they are. The biggest one we've got so far. Yes, it's well. Friendships seem to last a lifetime here. It was probably because of close communities within the town, with its enclaves of European migrants, and its Italians made one of its largest influences. My wife would be one of the best fish fillers in Fort Pirie. Um, I was only about 18, 19 when I met her. Through, the fish, through me selling me fish at uh, S.D. Caputa's and Sons. She was a daughter, and we got together that way. Because she was a nice-looking girl, though. She was a Caputo, mate. Oh, she... <laughs> Better, pretty than you. Oh, yeah, but she hasn't got a moustache like me. <laughs> Come on, Pawnee. Oh, I may have messed with that. I've got three kids home, and uh, none of them can speak Italian because we don't speak Italian home. They wouldn't have heard the first word about it, Italian word, or all Australian art. Probably, uh, my father, mother and father was born in Italy. Uh, they come to Australia, well, they've been about 50 years, 55 years in Australia now. But I was, I was Australian born, I was. I, uh, I was born in Australia. My two sisters and two of my brothers, they were born in, uh, in Italy, but I was Australian born. Practically all of the Italians of Port Perry came at different times over the last century, but most came from one place, Malfetta. Here they made their home in this new world, starting a fishing industry and giving a lasting and interesting culture to this bleak landscape. I've heard a lot about it. I wouldn't mind going to Malfetta because, uh, and uh, I got the evil got my uncles and aunties there. It was only after I left that I discovered that it isn't necessarily an Italian world everywhere else. And I had missed them. What channel is this one here? Ah, channel two. Channel two, mate, channel one. 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 But you can't tell me the name of the swagman in Wilson Matilda. The name of the swagman in yeah. Wilson Matilda? Yeah. <laughs> the is, they, they don't mention his name. Yes, they do. Andy. Andy Sang. Andy Sang. <laughs> <laughs> Andy watch to the way to the Billy Bob. Yeah. <laughs> anybody, anybody that contact Andy Poster. That's that, 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 that. <laughs> Tonight's main story is 200 jobs may go as Pazmenko DAKS embarks on an efficiency study. The plans are being formulated under a benchmark improvement study currently underway. The smelters are comparing their performance in Port Pirri against major international competitors. The study aims to increase productivity while reducing staffing levels. Pazmenko Metals BHAS plans to streamline its work, reducing the workforce from 1,200 to 1,000. Plans were outlined by Operations General Manager Ken Parks at last night's council meeting. What Ken did was outlined to us a number of proposals, particularly in terms of environmental actions that they're taking. And then uh, the rationalisation of the Tasmanco operations will ensure the, uh, the, the viability of the smelter for at least the next 20 years. As Ken said, it's better to have um, a, a long-term viable smelter with less, less labour involved than a, a short-term uh, viable smelter with a lot more people involved. And I think that's, that's quite true. Did you learn about the news last night? The railway, the train drivers and stuff. Because uh, there's been 130 people who've missed their jobs support customers. Mm. The smelters that are uh, giving everyone the uh, handshake, that's 300. That's a lot of families. That means that, uh, well, they'll, they'll be moving. Are there 300 jobs in Port Pirie? Pirie is dying slowly. Well, we are industrial and uh, we probably always will be. So we have to look at more industry. But we're self-employed only because we had to be. Yeah. Oh. 
To those I was able to speak to, nobody seemed to have a positive feeling towards their future in Port Pirie. What time do you start? What are you pulling out? What have I got? A hanky. I'm plumbing those. Anybody got that, there's a book. Export's different, and here uh, everyone's prepared to do their best. They're getting the tonnages that are required. They can't increase it anymore because they're working with the safe working practices as it is. But they want more, and the only way they can get it is by working your double shifts. And we go on back to the old days. We're going to start firm, working we again. Uh, same hours that the old, the old fathers used to work from. Uh, Seven o'clock to about ten o'clock at night. Generation worker. In, in my father's time, uh, worked for 24 hours to go home and fall down and have a, have a sleep. And the picking up of labour in those days was the first one back, got the next job. There's, there's, uh, the old, there's no future uh, for the uh, for old uh, kids. What they're trying to do is have a basic permanent workforce and then just draw from any means possible to get the cheapest labour, which is means non-permanent labour uh, in all industry. We're only numbers. We're not humans to the big companies. Oh, have you uh, seen this? Labor. The recorder last night. 115 jobs that the Evertors not lost. And um, so there's 115 families in Piri that are going to be suffer suffering. And they've just upgraded it to, to uh, make it um, export, export standard in the last um, 12 months. And um, Lord O'Neill bloke, he's threatened to resign from the Labor Party and stand as an independent candidate for the next federal election because he's not happy about the, um, the railway situation. This is going to be very bad for Port Perry. It doesn't look too good for Lloyd O'Neill either. He's their local member of parliament. And like all politicians, he has to worry about his job every few years. After all, this is a town used to having full employment. It's also a town that never worried too much about what came out from the smelters' smokestacks. I remember it was usual to get up in the mornings and not be able to see across the road. Days of sulphur, darkness for many days until the wind changed direction and blew it away. Away from the smelters. A colossal thing, built like a set from Metropolis. closely associated with Broken Hill. So I guess in 1986 there was a few problems at Broken Hill, but uh, at the moment about 80% of our material comes from there, but we do treat concentrates uh, from other Pasminko mines, but also from uh, all over the world. In fact, at the moment we've got uh, some Faro concentrates that come from Canada. So our, our, our constant aim is to become more productive, to remain competitive. Uh, we really have to be more productive, because that means essentially uh, having a smaller workforce. But it's the name of the game today, it's uh, what everyone else is doing.
operating here for over 100 years and its peak employment was over 2,000. Now a lot of people are worried about BHAS, now Pasmenko Metals, cutting the workforce from 1,200 to 990. BHAS once employed 1,000 and now only employs hundreds. A lot has been said, if BHAS goes, so will the town. Everything else will suffer. You know what over Port Kiri is, don't you? You know, we got people say, oh, it's a horrible old place, a city of lead and all that. All right. So I changed that some way, and I call it Port Kiri, my little town of gold. Hope you enjoy. There's a city called Port Kiri. It's got the trail who's gold and more. It's lifestyle. Me. I'd almost forgotten it was my birthday. Get him, get him, get him. Get him. <laughs> I told you, he'd come in with that gear on. I've just said to him, a thousand to one, he'll come in with that gear on his head. And that thing in his hand. Look at this one, pissing into your head. You haven't seen yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah,
<laughs> I remember you used to make these little shoe boxes up, a uh, piece of wire through and toilet paper, and you used to draw on them. And we, us kids would sit around and watch you do these movies. I was 14 and you were 15, 30 odd years ago. You remember the Ozone Theatre? Yeah. Yeah. I used to do all your film footage. We had bits of lightning cut out and we used to throw them in and whip them all out. And uh, here's a good example of what's happening, where um, the houses, you can see the houses have been decontaminated, done up. Uh, the the uh, footpaths have been uh, uh, paved to keep the dust down, and then uh, lots and lots of trees have been planted. This area recently would have been a very desolate area, uh, but now uh, we've got a really good urban renewal program going in this area. And as well, there is the old uranium processing plant from a time when Australia thought it had an atomic future. But since abandoned in the 1950s, and now I've heard there's new plans for it. argument about whether or not in fact in a sense this whole community should be relocated and I think quite rightly so what people were saying was no you can't do that because this is a community within a community in a sense in Port Perry a, a very tight-knit community one that's proud of itself proud of its past and in a sense confident about the future how are you oh. I didn't try these days a lot of care is taken with the children regular blood tests testing their levels of lead contamination until the age of three. You've been a very good girl. reopen the old uranium works, reuse the old tailing, bring in new high technology and industry of rare earths and ceramics. Could be a bonanza of over a hundred jobs, <laughs> but not everyone wants it near their home. Uh, well, this is um, the foresight for Essex Holdings uh, as an enrichment plant. Um, also, Essex Holdings plan to have a bonsai cracking plant here. Right in front of us here now, is one of the tailing dams that they want to take extraction from. Now, um, uh, radiation, they do admit um, radiation. And um, this is the thing that we're totally against. You know? This is one thing that we're totally against. Um, if you take from the first part of the dam here, if you just look across this way here, as you see the slag heaps coming across, uh, there are the dams that have been filled. Uh, the reason for this one not being filled, I wouldn't have a clue, I'd have no idea whatsoever. The uranium uh, plant that was here years ago, um, uh, this is uh, what was left behind. This area hasn't yet had the full um, urban renewal program. You can see the footpaths haven't been paved. Back there is a significant amount of weed growth, which I guess is the council's responsibility to get rid of. We won't talk about that, though. <laughs> oh, well. Then the other dams have been filled in, you know? They have been pulled in. Yeah. They even, even kids, as we have here, um, they can come around here. Any kid can come around here and play. They have done for years. They have done it.
away, so I got it all out, and then they just um, took the house away um, from that. And this was just a spare block with all weeds and all. And we um, got and we got brand new soil, and we put it all over here and made it our organic garden. We just want it because it's fun. And yeah. it makes it look prettier? Right, done all this, we didn't see all the lead or anything. I think they bulldozed it, and then they got all the contaminated um, dirt out and replaced it with some good soil. Is that like that thing behind me? I don't want to look at it. They've got loads up a while over there, mate. It'll clean itself, automatically clean oh, itself. Yeah. It's doing us out of work, right? Doing us out of work. No Quite good. a few men. No good. They used to be, oh, I reckon they're about nine, nine, three, nine. three or four days' work. Three or four nine days' nine work. Men. Nine men used nine to work men. every day of the week, yeah, every day. The nine men are nine men are nine men shift. Now it's down to zero. Down to zero now. Zero. Zero. Not one man. Don't be no supervisors. Just say, you know, it would be there for a week. They might be Yeah, builders. Yeah. Builders working there too, every well, shift. Yeah, all the transport, that's gone. Mm. The crane drivers working in Pasmigo, they miss out. Truck drivers, watermen, etc. They all miss out, so everybody's getting... Well, you've got a tape to play for me, huh? Sure have. All right, let's go down to the studio and we'll uh, have a listen to it. Okay. Okay. Let's line her up first. For the past month, I've been doing research around Port Perry to find out why the area will now be environmentally better off with a clean-up of the tailing stands after mining. And they're also not concerned with claims that the site has radiation risks. We don't think that it is dangerous, and nor does the, nor does the government, and nor does the health commission. But there hasn't been an environmental impact statement, has there? No, and there... Well, there obviously, really there should be an impact statement. statement. Sort of because the environment is at stake. Mm. Uh, if the environment's at stake, well, well, obviously... Well, there should be uh, an impact statement made. That uh, there is so little risk attaching to this particular stage one operation that there's no need for such an environmental impact statement. You're not too sure about what the radiation levels are going to be like? No, we can't be entirely sure. They are sure. Yeah. 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 What can you tell us at low level? I'm sorry, I'm not in a position to really put it in. You know, more well, what I was saying was. Uh, the world is a polluted place. I mean, we're, we're all in trouble. We need to have a good solid look at what's happening around the place. What we're doing here in Puri um, is kind of setting the pace. With the, the things, if you look at Puri 35 years ago when you were here, you know, okay, it's, it'll be a different story. 100 years ago, you look at a photograph of Port Puri and they were dropping 2,000 tonnes of lead on the town around Puri. At, at the moment we're pushing for a new a new uh, monazite cracking plant in which is a heavy heavy metal industry and uh, I'm, it terrifies That's me. Right. They're going to reopen that as they no, use them. They took over the site and they cleaned up the mess that they left, they left the behind and they've done a good job of that. There's no doubt about that. But. That's only a leg in the door, so that then we can go for a fully blown monazite cracker. And start importing uh, ore and the ore and concentrate from other areas. And because sooner or later, what they've got here is going to run out. So you don't build a multi million dollar plant just to you know, use up six months or 12 months of uh, concentrate that is stored in the, in the dams, the settling dams out there. As kids, we used to play on the bloody things. Yeah, you know, you used to. Yeah, and then well, you find out... I wonder why you got no that. hair and you're an yeah. alcoholic at 20 but years of age. But as you say, age. my dad... Oh, it's a... not because I smoke cigarettes, I can assure you that. It's, I think there's something else here. It's called cool genetics, but... Perhaps it's the cadmium or the bismuth or the... The lead or the uranium or whatever. Whatever other heavy metal we've had dumped on our doors. What about girls and, and, and ladies? Yeah. There's a, something in the air about this uranium plant going. You know, I mean, people are, are up in arms. We don't really want it here. But why, why do we want it here? Just for the jobs. Is it worth our health? You know, we just don't know what, what's going on. That's really sad. Um, well, this is a waiver of exemption that I was expected to sign. 
And virtually says here, the agreement provides for the following operations to be carried out. Mining of tailings, sediments, salts, by an in situ leaching, and other such operations as may be approved by the Chief Inspector of Mines. And that's about exactly what they wanted me to sign. And that's the piece of paper there. So at the time, I decided not to sign it. If I had signed it, virtually what I was doing was signing away my home, even my family. So I had to front up in court um, to stand up for myself. I love Paul Perry, and this is exactly why I'm taking this stand. If I signed that form, I had no comeback on anything whatsoever. It's not worth nothing. That's what I think of it. Sign the back of it, pour it over like that, use it for the toilet. What's your situation going on the railways, in the railways? Well, I've uh, put in for a uh, redundancy uh, package. You got a letter? I've got a letter. They just uh, uh, advised us of what's happening with the redundancy. They have also told us that uh, uh, if you are interested, you let them know. And if you want to accept, you tick, I accept. Well, when I got in in 1937, it was classed for the slave days. You was lucky to get a, get a job. You would have to go on a pick-up corner and you would have to be for, uh, fortunate for a foreman to walk in and, and pick you up. And you had to just work as required. Basically what happens and, uh, is that the credit union provide the investment place. advice for the members. What suits one person or couple may not suit um, somebody else. Yeah. Is there a number of groups you can be contacted on there or is it fairly difficult? Well, no, not really. Like, oh, rational, all these fancy words, are they yuppie words? I don't know if they're yuppie words, but uh, if they don't want you, they're just throwing you on the heap. Uh, the big companies don't worry about individuals, I think. They just want more money. Like they said in, uh, what was that movie with Michael Douglas? Can't think of the name of it. Oh, Wall Street. Greed, that's the right word? Not to worry. We'll get by. The clock turns. It goes around, it's a revolution. It happens in everything. They get into warpies now. The clock will, the wheel will turn. We'll get there again one day. It's no worries. It's a of practically every place all over Australia. And as a matter of fact, all over the world. Industrial we don't know where it's going to finish up. Managers so, you know, see what we do. <laughs> we have broadcast and all this sort of thing. We tend not to so give it that much thought. You know, we know there's an unemployment problem here. But, you know, that's showing how much uh, concern there is shown by, by people in the city, which is positive in some respects. Ideas of how to, you know, improve the situation. I haven't thought about it. I mean, okay. I'm out of I'm unemployed. I'm unemployed, but I know what I'm going to do. So I don't think of theory and people out of work is theory. But when I talk to everyone, I didn't realise how... They how it did affect them. Like, they, not they many people talk about it, but when you ask them, the, you know, smell yeah, it is bad, it is bad, it's dumb, I want to get out, and things so like that. that. Uh, we could ensure that... Yeah, well, worked all my life, been pretty lucky, I suppose, and uh, comes to an end sooner or later. Uh, uh, most of our children are here, and we've lived here all our lives, so. and I wouldn't go to the city. There's plenty of worse places than Port Perry. Why can't we do something? We need to look towards a bright future. Let's start thinking positive. Young people like myself would like to think of a positive future in Perry. The surge of departing young people from the town is too great to be condoned. After all, the young are the future. Sir? I don't know, Angie. Um, it's hard to comprehend that there are people out there unemployed that are suffering. Um, because we so much rely on BHAS, I've got a positive thing for you. Our little jingle is a thing of positiveness. I've been living in the center state, well, from my early days, and it's number one to me. I love the lifestyle, I love the people, I love the atmosphere. Center state, 104 5CS. 5CS. Seen the rough times and the tough times, I've been there all the time. Center state.
were saying that maybe some positive this can come out of it when we just think about it and find out ways how we can perhaps get things back on the on the right track. That's well done. Congratulations. Thanks. I didn't ever think I would come back. I'd left it all so long ago. I often wondered what might have been if I'd stayed. But now we'll wonder what will come. After all, the town is its people. People who have come through such a lot and perhaps deserve a little better. Better from those who run things. Because any town like this is its people. You work hard and care, and even though I won't really ever go back, I can't forget them. Remembering many good things, good times. It's people that do that. Important people. There's no place like home. Port Curie, a city of friendly people. I'm proud of it. Best place in the world. Guarantee it. Port Curie's controversial rare earths refining plant has been given the go-ahead by the government. SX holding officials say they are very pleased to have won approval from the Department of Environment and Planning. They aim to commence construction of a monazite cracking plant with rare earth separating capacity by July next year. The production of rare earths, which are essential products in many high-tech industries, involves refining radioactive material. Conditions are also attached to approval, including emergency contingency plans, dust suppression Anybody and disposal of waste at Olympic Dam. Work must commence within two years, and the company plans to report up to two.